Welcome to Crisis and Hope, Why You Voices. Crisis and Hope is a project of the Center for Israel Studies, the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies and Judaic Studies at YU, Madea Yadut. My name is Ronnie Pirellis. I'm a professor of Jewish history and the director of the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program of International Affairs at Yeshiva University. Uh, today, we welcome you to Cities, Suburbs, and Race. When we began this series in June, we wanted to create a forum that would go beyond the headlines and tweets and talking points that often pass for political and cultural discourse. We wanted a space for nuance, depth, and perspective. We believe that the past can inform and bring light to the present and even give us hope in moments of confusion and despair. For that reason, I am so honored to invite all of you here today with our special guest, Dr. Hannah Leibovitz, who will be in conversation with our very own Professor Jess Olson. This program will be part of Professor Jess Olson's graduate seminar on Jews and Blacks in the United States. And we welcome Professor, J Professor Olson's students, along with all of you tuning in from near and far. Dr. Hannah Leibovitz is an assistant professor of public affairs at the University of Texas Arlington. Her research interests relate to human-centered sustainability in urban and metropolitan contexts, Dr. Leibovitz is dedicated to analyzing, interpreting, and communicating the elements necessary to ensure goods, resources, and opportunities are accessible, acquired through just means, and retained through systems of mutual accountability. Amen. As she generally considers governmental and nonprofit organizations to be primary drivers of these efforts, her work opens up these institutions to determine how they can best function for all people. Dr. Leibovitz's academic work has appeared in several peer reviewed journals and her public scholarship has appeared in local, national, international media publications. In Jewish media outlets, she frequently writes about the intersection between her scholarly work and her life as a religious Jew. I have a feeling that's why many of you are here. Um, she attended Turo's Lander College for Women and received her PhD at Cleveland State University. She currently lives in Dallas with her family. Uh, we could not know that we, when we reached out to Dr. Leibovitz this summer that this afternoon there'd be a verdict in the murder against George Floyd. Floyd. Nor could we have known that the verdict, what the verdict would be. However, all of us here tonight have experienced and witnessed and grappled with the upheaval at the center of race, class, and identity in our beloved country. The events of the last year have highlighted the fissures in our society, the fault lines and breaking points that shape the way we live and interact and often do not interact with our neighbors and fellow citizens. There is widespread discussion about the future of cities and the transformation of our great urban centers, but we have also come to realize the centrality of our suburbs. And for that reason, we have wanted Dr. Leibovitz to join us here to bring her expertise in urban studies and her insights into the social, economic, and racial dynamics of the ways we organize our space into this discussion. We hope that we can learn lessons, that we can craft a more fair, harmonious, and enlightened future for us all. So without any further ado, let's begin this discussion. Please, uh, please submit your questions to the chat. Uh, keep yourselves on mute, keep yourselves muted till the end well, we will have time for discussion and questions, but please keep the questions going to the chat. I and uh, Professor Fine will be monitoring this and sending this along to Professor Olson and, and, and Dr. Leibovitz. So really, this is wonderful. Thank you so much and, and, and let's begin. Oh, I'm sorry. Sh shall I shall I say something? Uh, I beg your pardon. We didn't rehearse this bit. Uh, my name is Professor Olson. I'm a professor of Jewish studies here at Yeshiva University. And as uh, my my uh, dear colleague Ronnie Perellis mentioned, uh, over the last year, uh, many of us have been shaken by the events that that unfolded in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. In fact, I can say with uh, with with conviction that this is one of the reasons why we are here tonight. Uh, that this this initiative was in fact uh, born of, of my colleagues and my uh, desire to, to, to add, you know, something useful to the conversation. And so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Leibovitz here. Um, I do want to add one thing. 
Uh, Professor Leibowitz, and, and I, I don't want to speak for her, but has mentioned that, that it is her interest to be as engaged as possible with our audience. So do feel free uh, over the course of the, of the conversation to submit your questions and, uh, and we, will, we will try to uh, bring them into the conversation. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome and, and I'm very grateful, very grateful uh, for Dr. Leibowitz appearing with us tonight and, and, uh, and thank you and, and uh, I turn the floor over. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. And it's so great uh, to be here for this forum and to be at something at YU. Uh, I am not an alumna of, what, of YU or any of kind of the Yeshiva University system, but have you know long admired a lot of the work that you all do. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you know, it's a it's an interesting day because I think a lot of us weren't really sure how this case was going to go, um, and how the trial was going to go. And obviously, you know, last week we had uh, the interruption of a murder trial for another murder. So um, I think we're all still really at that heightened level that we were at a year ago. Uh, it really hasn't calmed down. We've had some political changes, but we're still very much feeling a lot of that unrest and that tension. And a lot of my interest in my research and honestly in being a scholar in general has been around unrest and tension. Why people feel that, what they do about that, um, how that plays out, not just socially, which I think we talk a lot about, but spatially. And so my goal for tonight, for all of you, you know, you can like literally forget everything I say, I do not take it personally. I not only have students, but I also have children. So I pretty much expect nobody listens to me. But if, if nothing else, just come away from this thinking a little bit more about space. Because what we don't really do a great job at when we teach people about things, we teach about time, we teach about social interactions, we don't teach about space. We don't help people understand the spatiality of something. So for example, racism is a sociological phenomenon, but segregation is a spatial one, right? Segregation is the actual pulling away of different peoples across space. Racism could be something you feel in your heart when somebody is standing literally right next to you. But segregation is when you are forced to be far away from someone. And I think that that's a really important differentiation that we don't make nearly enough that I hope that you all come away with tonight. So when you leave tonight, just remember the word spatiality. And when you start to think about something like fear, tension, anger, what's the spatiality of fear? What's the spatiality of tension? What's the spatiality of anger? How do these play out spatially? Because as humans, we exist in space. We take up space, we create space. We put values into space when we make it place, right? We take an undeveloped space and we say, I want there to be a housing development there. Well, why a housing development? And for which group of people? And who's going to design it? And why is that development allowed to be built, but that other place is an absolute mess, right? We, we take values that we have, we put them into space, we create place. And that's what I've been really interested in when I think about tension, when I think about fear, it plays out spatially. The reason it plays out spatially is because in the era of modernity of uh, industrialized and post-industrial capitalism, material land value is more significant than agricultural land value that didn't used to exist. We used to determine the value of a land based on what you could grow on there. We now determine the value of the value of a land based on what you can build on there. That's, those are two very different things. And before we had that understanding of land, before we started to see that, before we started to invest in that way, we didn't really give that much weight to what happened on that land. Land use was about protecting you know, owners' rights to do what they wanted on their land, but not to develop that land in a specific way. Um, zoning didn't exist till less than 100 years ago, right? These things that we now live with very frequently that, that, that help us navigate what we can and cannot do in space and where we can and cannot be are very, very new. Um, and so a lot of what we think about and experience constantly has to do with space and race especially, because like I said, racism is a sociological phenomenon, right? Um, Unfortunately, the term critical race theory is politicized today. It shouldn't be just like none of our academic scholarship should be politicized. Um, but what critical race theory argues, and it's only one theory, it's not the sole theory that everybody uses all the time, but essentially what it argues is that there's no real, there's no such thing as race 
really, right? There are there are different groups of people that stem from different nationalities that might have different cultures, but but race as something that determines value or determines um, out you know some some sort of output doesn't really exist. But we create it so that we can then use it to oppress certain groups of people. And we sustain that creation so that other groups remain not oppressed. So that you know, having a certain racial identity allows you to do things and get away with it scot-free. And having a different racial identity puts you in this group of people who can be oppressed. Um, and you can be oppressed because of all these myths that we tie to your race. And so that's a sociological phenomenon, right? But what happens is that we take racism and we put it into space. We put it into our capital investments in space. And we do that by saying, if you're of this racial group, you can't live here. If you're of that racial group, you can only live there. When that racial group lives here, these are all the resources we give to that space. But when that racial group lives here, mm, not so much, right? And these are really, really, really new phenomena. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I have to say, I don't know how many people are aware of what's called the Fair Housing Act. Um, it's a federal policy that prohibits discrimination in selling or renting housing or, or giving loans for housing. It's like a little more than 50 years old, right? This is really, 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 really close to where we are. Um, more recent than the Holocaust, uh, this perpetuating racial discrimination in this country through segregation. And what it's done is that it's shaped a lot of the ways that we live and it's shaped a lot of not just how we live, but how we govern. Because a hundred years ago, you had cities, okay? A hundred, let's start 150 years ago. You had cities and you had rural areas. Rural areas were all were built all around the agricultural land development and cities were built around material land development. But then what happened in the late um, 19th century is that some folks in those cities started to say, hey, you know, we really don't wanna live here. It's cramped when there's a disease, nobody deals with it, right? There's really weak urban governance. And so they said, we don't really have to live here anymore. And they took their money and they invested their money into material land development somewhere else. And what they did when they did that, because they also had to create what we call economies of scale, which is why cities exist. So that for example, your water, your sewage, things like that, they cost a lot less because a lot of people are using them around you. That's an economy of scale. So what a lot of these people did was say, hey, I can't move out to nowhere by myself because then I'm not gonna have anything. But if I get a group of people, we can all move out there and then we'll all share those resources and we'll all pay into it. And of course, it's gonna be like my select group of people. It's not just gonna be a bunch of randos we're gonna let in there. So they all moved to these different areas and that's what we call the first ring of suburbs. And what happened was these first ring of suburbs were usually connected by let's say streetcars into the city so that they could still get into the city uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, they, they still were somewhat connected, but they were fully residential areas intended to not be commercial in any way, um, intended to not be industrial in any way. And that's where we actually have the rise of what we call zoning, which is the determination of design and land use. Um, city right where I used to live uh, called Euclid, Ohio, right outside of the city of Cleveland, first U.S. Supreme Court zoning case, essentially they said that a company could not build what they wanted to build in one spot. They said, no, actually, we've decided that spot isn't for that use. And the company said, you're not allowed to do that. Like, we can build wherever we want to build. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, actually, cities can do that. That's within city power. You can decide where something is in your city and where it can be built or not built. And boom, across the country, zoning codes pop up everywhere. All of a sudden, it's the new in thing. We are going to have zoning. We are going to tell you that your city has to be 97% residential, single family detached housing. What happens when we do that? Anybody? Professor Olson. People with means and privilege are able to expend their resources to, uh, to invest in that. And those without those resources and means aren't. Yeah, material land development costs money. And if you can only have single family detached homes in your city, you can't get into that city if you don't have the money. And so only people with means, uh, very often, again, because of racism, only white people uh, or, or predominantly white people with means start moving out to these places. And what happens is you have this pull away from the city just as the great migration is coming up to the north. 
and Black people are moving in. It's like almost as if it's connected. Spoiler alert, it is. And you see all these people coming into the cities and then a massive like fled, fleeing out of the city. We literally call it white flight. Um, and that's the first ring of suburbs. And they're highly inequitable, but very few people really care because most of what cities are doing at the time is economic growth, okay? So what they're doing is they're factories, um, they're building the local economy. Um, they're not highly interconnected with other cities. Uh, they don't have a massive political, you know, value, uh, except in that, you know, during, during earlier eras, you know, it's kind of like rural versus urban, but the cities themselves don't, aren't really, you know, mega connected. There's not really all that value. They're still growing because people are coming up from rural areas and coming there. So it's like, okay, this isn't great, um, but maybe we can make this work. Who knows? Um, then comes World War I, World War II. And what we find out in World War II is that we actually can invest tons more money into land like tons, because now we have all this industrial growth and we can move it places. And we can go from one city to the next city and we can create massive conglomerates of economies and we can create regions. Instead of just like Cleveland does this and Chicago does that, we have the Cleveland to Chicago connection. We have the rust belt, right? We have all these places that we start to combine together and we start to create these regions and we want them to be hyper-connected. We wanna move goods and services across all of these regions. And so we start to invest in ma massive amounts of capital, like massive. I don't know if anyone here knows what the Federal Highway Act is, but they put a ton of money into infrastructure. Um, everything is infrastructure, let me just say. But they put a ton of money into infrastructure, into creating these new highways, into creating these, you know, it, it helping these, these suburbs grow. And also after the Second World War, you had all these folks who came back from the war and they said, I don't have a job. I don't have a house. This is what I want. I just served in your war. And so we also have the GI Bill and we have massive amounts of money going into giving people literally homes. And we have what's called workforce housing, which at the time literally meant if you worked, you could be housed. OK, we do not have that in this country anymore. Um, we built loads and loads and loads of housing. At the same time, we restricted loads and loads of housing. We did not allow people who were Black, Catholic, Jewish, whole bunch of things into the suburbs. You just could not live there. It was done. It was over. There was nothing you could do. So then we have the Fair Housing Act, a few other federal level, you know, um, federal level policies that are passed. But at the local level, they're not enforced. Okay, I did research on this one city called Maple Heights in Ohio. Guess what year they, they enforced their Federal Housing Act? 1982, okay? 1982, okay? From 1968 when it passed at the federal level. So these aren't enforced. Nobody's listening. It doesn't matter until some Black people start to gain wealth. And they start wanting to move to the suburbs because now they can afford a home. And so now they don't necessarily have to go through the banks or, you know, redlining, which was what the banks used to do. They used to kind of say different neighborhoods can get monies for loans. Redlining's over. They can, they can get some cr credit. Um, they start to move to the inner ring suburbs. And all the white people there are like, nope. So they do this thing called block busting, uh, where real estate agents go to a block and say, look, there's black people moving in. You don't want them on your street. Sell me your house real quick, real cheap, and I'll sell it to them. And then they sold the house real cheap, you know, and then black people had to buy them at exorbitant prices and lost a lot of money there um, for, for something that had very little actual value. So all of these black folks start moving into the inner ring suburbs, white flight, boom, out to the outer ring suburbs. Now, what happens right then? You created a city in order to be exclusionary. And now there's this whole group of diverse, a diverse group that moves into that city. What happens? Your city's not ready for them. Your city can't run for them. Your city has no representation of them. You know, your city's sustaining, you know, the few white families that have stayed are pretty much the ones who continue to run the whole city. 
even here in Dallas, it wasn't until the 1980s that there that the city wasn't run by this like weird kind of commission of white folks who thought they knew what was going on, right? This is happening across the country. As diversity comes in, people are not giving up their political strength. So instead, they put these values into administrative systems. They put them into policing systems. They put them into increased zoning and housing codes. Uh, another case out of Cleveland called, uh, in a city called East Cleveland actually, um, called the Mrs. Moore, Inez Moore case. Uh, a black woman who was the head of her family. She had her, her son, grandson, I believe nephew, living in her home. And according to the zoning code in the city of East Cleveland, you're not allowed to have a family member who is not blood, like Ben Ahar Ben blood relative living in your home, obviously to keep large black families from being able to move there. Um, so, you know, all of these things, they keep trying to use all these administrative systems to keep people out and to keep people, if they come further and further and further oppressed. Um, you know, by show of hands, I guess for the people who are on, uh, who are on, who are on camera. Um, uh, yeah, so does anybody know about what happened a couple years ago in this place called Ferguson? Anybody heard of that? Okay, okay. So what people mostly know about Ferguson, Missouri is that there was another case of obviously of police violence, right? That someone was killed by the police. What people don't know is that for years prior to that, the city of Ferguson was using their fine and fee system to overwhelmingly fine and fee people of color for literally just existing, for driving, for walking down the street in a certain way, fine, 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 fee, 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 lose your license, lose your job, all over the place. And there was so much tension in the city that when this finally blew up from a single act, which obviously was a horrifying act, the whole city went mad and everyone says, well, you know, it's just that one event. It's just that one police officer. It's a bad apple. It's a bad city. It's a city that does not know what to do with racial diversity. I will say Ferguson just elected their first black female mayor. So hopefully that's a change. The city was run by fully white people. Okay. While the majority of the population was black. And so these are the things that we don't always talk about, that we don't always see, that we don't always understand, but it plays into the space that we live in. It plays into how we can experience space. So I am a white woman. I live in Dallas. I walk down my street. I don't have the nicest, biggest home in Dallas, Baruch Hashem. I do not want that. Dallas is actually known for being incredibly gaudy. It's embarrassing. Um, some of these people, I'm like, look at your house. And, but you know what, when I walk down my neighborhood, no one gets scared. I have the ability to navigate space as a white woman in a way where I still feel safe. Other people in my neighborhood, other people in my city can't do that because the whole system was designed around them not being there. We have gated communities across the country in which if somebody even walks up to the gate, they can get shot, right? They're not supposed to be there. So if they're not supposed to be there, we have to disinvest once they get there. That's just what's going to happen. There is going to be a massive disinvestment in these spaces once people get there, once black and brown people get there. Now, what happens when we want to start investing in those spaces? Raise your hand if you know what the word gentrification is. Yes, gentrification is the development of space for a more affluent and more white population. That is the definition. Gentrification is the development of space intended for a more white and more affluent population. We do not invest in the community that's there. We invest for a community we want to come. And so this creates more tension and there's constant tension, constant tension. And that's why cities burst when something happens. It's not about the individual experience. It's about all the tension surrounding it and the systems that are set up in which you just cannot be successful. As an individual, you can. As a community, absolutely not. We consistently create systems that destroy communal bonds in Black neighborhoods. The federal highway system, interstate, inner city highway systems intended to destroy Black neighborhoods, which were considered to be slums because they were black and they weren't getting enough housing support. Last thing we have now going on, suburbs, suburbanization, limit of housing supply. So 
lots and lots and lots of expensive housing. You cannot get in there. You cannot get into their neighborhoods, but very, very, very good resources, inequitable resources. Where you live in this country determines your quality of life for the rest of your life. It determines how good your education can be. It determines what job options you have. It determines what connections you make, all because of where you live. So when we think about cities and suburbs and race, we're really thinking about the spatiality of racism. The ways that we take racism, which is a sociological phenomenon, and we put it into space and we put it into a way we control space and we ensure consistently and systemically that if black and brown people live in that space, there is no investment in that space. There is only disinvestment. There is a lack of representation politically. There are few economic options there's a limited housing supply, and there aren't enough uh, redistributive systems to support what needs to happen for investment. This is kind of like my intro. I know I'm going a little bit long, but I want to ask Professor Olson to maybe sort of jump in and take it from here because I have so much more I could say. I teach like a four hour class on this like 16 times over the semester. I, I have to no, um, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for a moment as as a you know in my in my little world of of being a professor in Revel with my class here and and again props and welcome to them, uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, but I wanted to add that what we looked at uh, for this week in preparation for your lecture was actually Richard Rothstein's book uh, The Color of Law, which makes many of the points that you make. Now I recall uh, being a graduate student in Palo Alto, and one of the case studies that he brings really at the forefront of the book is really the constructed effort to you know, situate the Silicon Valley before it was called the Silicon Valley in such a way that any multifamily dwelling was, was intentionally excluded, uh, really to prevent um, the, the issue of black employees at the Ford plant in Richmond uh, commuting down to south of, of uh, Palo Alto uh, where Ford had relocated, uh, I wanna say Hayward, but I don't think it's not Hayward, Hayward is East Bay. At any rate, the entire intention of the construction of the entire geography of the region was based upon a perceived need to exclude any diversity in the neighborhoods. And I can tell you, growing up, I'm not growing up, what am I saying? Going to grad school in Palo Alto and uh, the exorbitant uh, housing prices, the exorbitant, um, you know, the, the impossibility of anybody who is not a Silicon Valley.com million and now probably billionaire uh you know uh would have uh would would is is beyond beyond you know beyond the grasp of anybody so so not only uh does this affect you know just the basic dynamics of race relations in America it affects everybody it affects culture it affects so the in this, in this kind of connects to a larger theme that's been developing right uh in some of the literature of thinking about you know how much has America done to to essentially um, shoot itself in the foot in order to maintain this color line. Um, so I mean, it's by design though. I don't think people think they're shooting themselves in the foot, right? Like, I think that in the US, we, we um, you can see based on our constitution, what we consider to be rights of people, right? What, what we consider to be essential freedoms. Mm -hmm. And those essential freedoms all still look like people, are, are intended to still look like people who looked like the framers of the constitution, right? They're not essential freedoms given to people who don't look like that. So freedom of religion, you can practice whatever religion you want and you're still white. Um, you know, and I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of racial dynamics that are intentionally placed into the way that we've, you know, constructed this country. Mm -hmm. California is a great example because they are so liberal, except when it comes to housing, they won't build housing. Um, the city of Paris built more housing in 2019 than the entire state of California. Uh, it's intentional, right? It's, it's by design. They, um, and they have the way that we politically cut up spaces, right? So it's not just about the something getting built because the whole process of how you build it is so politically controlled mm -hmm. um, intentionally and so uh, and with so much discretion in that in that political body um, that you know the state of California can say look there's a housing crisis but cities you gotta you gotta do it you gotta deal with it right and then cities say look there's a housing crisis but we have the power to limit what, what's in our city and this is what works right 
Um, Cause what works is obviously only having wealthy white families there, right? I mean, obviously that works. <laughs> Diversity is, you know, and, and movements towards justice and to, to, towards integration, bringing more people together is not easy. It's actually not our norm. Uh, our norm is to stay further away from people who we don't consider to be like ourselves. In fact, our norm is to build density with people who look like ourselves and to reduce density with people who don't look like us. Um, I used to draw these like really terrible network maps on my whiteboard. Uh, I, I won't I won't make you all suffer through those. Um, are, you think sure? are you sure? Are, Hannah, are you sure? It sounds like a great visual. I mean, but I don't want to. Okay, okay. I'm gonna make you all sick for a second. <laughs> We're gonna go over to my whiteboard. Hold on here. Okay. So so if you think about it this way, um, you know, here are a bunch of random individual people okay and this is at any like given point in their lives do you see these lines can you all see them okay yeah. so this is at any and any given point in their lives they're just wherever right and then they find communities so they sort of all can join here together they try to build density around an issue around an identity whatever it is and what they do when they build this density is they can also then, you know, say, okay, well, this is our issue. So we'll also extend it over here. We'll extend it over here. We'll extend it over here. And you create this like network of people who you've decided fit into your central identity or central community. And it's very, very, very easy when you do this to also exclude all of the people over here. It's just incredibly easy because you create community only around what you see as your values and your identity. And then you continue to extend it only around that. There's a great book by a sociologist called Jeremy Levine. Uh, it's coming out in just a few months uh, on community and the way that people actually more often use community to exclude than to include, right? So it's all about drawing this circle and then drawing it really narrowly and then even more narrowly, and then even more narrowly, and then saying, okay, now we can get one strand out there, and one strand out there, and one strand out there. So this is the one black guy that we're okay with, we'll keep him. And this is the one person we're fine with here, but we don't actually have to accept this community or this community. We don't create what we call polycentric networks, right? We don't create a connection between all of these. We just create our network and we keep it really narrow and really tight. And I will say that I think the religious Jewish community is especially very good and bad at doing this. Um, we're very, very good at creating this. Like we're so good at that. We invest money and time and resources to really create that density where you like, when you're plugged into the Jewish community, you're like, you got it all. You have access to everything. People will take care of you. But if you're even the tiniest bit on the outside, it's very hard to make it in. And if you have an identity that's not shared by like the Ashki normativity that I guess we might wanna call it, then it's very hard to get in. And if you're not Jewish, it's very hard to get in. It's very hard to get these resources. And it's really important to our communal sustainability that we do this because this is what keeps us all connected. But it's also a potential threat to other communities when we create this like really intense density that becomes exclusionary. The other thing, and this is what we've seen very, very recently with the uh, most recent election of, well, not most recent, I will say the previous election, <laughs> our previous administration, is that creating this intense density is actually also a threat to the people on the inside because they need the insularity because they're so scared. We've created a spatiality of fear you cannot leave the community. You can't. Everybody on the outside is evil. Everybody outside is a monster. Only people on the inside are okay. And that's what we have going on in rural America. And that's what we have going on in a lot of suburban America, still in the US. That's why we see in these maps, it's not just about you know which place goes red and which place goes blue. It's about the density of the red and the blue, right? It's about how these people in these communities are so interconnected and they like need it. They need to sustain it. Because if you grow it this way, if you grow community only through hyper exclusion, you're absolutely frightened by the idea of opening that up. It is immobilizing. We call it a nervous area. Okay, so fear to galvanize people, right? That's the fear that kind of um, instigates your fight or flight, 
right? When you, when you can get people to have that adrenaline high, when you get a big speaker who says, you know, this is the biggest threat since blah, 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 and you get all of these people together in a room, you get that adrenaline going, that's fear that galvanizes people. But information is very often fear that creates nervousness in people. They are immobilized. They can't do it. They can't handle it. They can't deal with it. And very often in a community like this, that fear, that second fear happens on the individual level. Whereas the fear that galvanizes happens on a communal level. So when you're down here, that's when you feel that fear and you're saying, oh man, like I'm a part of this group, but something's happening and something's going on. And, and maybe these people out here are also really good. And I don't, I don't know how this all works. When you're in here, oh, and there's 10,000 people in the arena and we're all talking and we're all on the same page and we got this, we all feel it, we're all there. That's why the previous election, <laughs> previous person in the White House, spent a lot of time doing these kinds of things, right? Let's have these massive events. Let's have these rallies. Let's get everybody in there, in that the spatiality, literally in a room, right? In that room, in close, talking about this thing, getting them scared, galvanizing, getting them involved, because God forbid they should go out this way and realize that it's actually more complex than that, that maybe I need other people in other communities to, to figure out things. Right? Or maybe what's going on in that community actually isn't so bad, like I've been told. Or maybe what's going on in my community is actually a problem. Right? So that's why we segregate ourselves. And we continue to segregate ourselves. We continue to segregate ourselves. And then when something happens and it blows up, right? why is there so much tension? Because it's that combination of fear that galvanizes and fear that makes you nervous. It's both happening at the same time. And you're simultaneously immobilized and you want to run a marathon. Right, I think that's also what a lot of us feel right now, what a lot of us have felt in the last year, is this like dance, like we're part of this, but we're part of this. And that's why after George Floyd's murder, so many people took to the streets, right, to be a part of this, to get to that point where they said, I'm so nervous, I'm so confused, I can't handle this, what's going on? Let me get into a group so we galvanize, so we're not by ourselves. Let's get a community, right? Everybody's always looking for that. But it's the question is whether we, create a community that is hyper-inclusive or a community that's intentionally exclusive. And over and over and over again, we prove that we are using community to exclude. I wonder if I could just speak to that for one moment, because we have a question and I'm going to give a little uh, brotherly, uh, I guess, fraternal pride in my sister, uh, Sarah, who's in the audience here asking this question, because uh, it speaks exactly to your point. You know, if exclusion and isolation is is part of the human condition, you know, what 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 do you think is 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 a is a is a way to answer that? So, uh, if anybody's familiar with the UN's uh, like goals for sustainability, um, so first of all, the answer is sustainability. Sustainability is literally the opposite of the human condition. The human condition is to use up resources without any idea of what the future will be. Right. Um, we just had Passover, Pesach. Right. We talked about like, what is a person who, um, you know, doesn't know what tomorrow is going to be like? How, how do they act? Right. Like we we try to get everything in today. Um, we, we, we try to constantly be thinking like, OK, we need this right now. Um, this is that's the human condition, the regular human condition. Sustainability is the opposite of that. Recognizing that what you have today is incredibly finite, even if you think it's not. It is actually incredibly finite. And if you don't invest in sustainability, if you don't invest in changing that, um, then you're just not gonna have it tomorrow or next year or in 10 years or in 30 years or in 50 years. And actually what you're doing today does matter for that time. Um, and so one of the UN sustainability goals is around integrated communities that actually you need to do a lot of this so that for the future sustainability of the human race, it's not natural. Right, it, it's, it's natural to want to only be with people who look like you, who feel like you, but we have to shift that mindset and say, actually, we have a shared humanity, right? That's kind of what the UN tries to do in general, whether they succeed or not, um, is to look around at everybody else and say, I'm a human, you're a human, ultimately, right? And I deserve housing and you deserve housing. Um, and when we lose that, we lose our ability to think about sustainability because we're only thinking about ourselves. Uh, another element of, you know, the modern times, hyper-individualization uh, comes from capitalism and this idea of like, oh, if I invest in something and I made money, I am amazing. Um, something that literally like the Torah tells us not to think constantly. <laughs> like it's constantly like, remember, like, 
just keep this in mind. But now that we're not farmers, we're like, that's not really a thing anymore. If I made an investment and I made money off of that, that's my money. Um, that's how that's how it is today, right? And so that's a lot of the a lot of what's a threat to the human condition is this idea that whatever I do is fine, it's perfect, it's going to be great. And if there's a problem in the future, like that's future's problems, um, you know. Like that's it's and it's the same way again spatially. It's the same way you think about it too. People who live in the suburbs, where there's an issue in the city, they're like that's the city's problem. Um, you know, I'll go to the city for a game. I'll go to the city for my job. I'll go to the city for all these fancy, nice amenities I like. But like urban poverty, oof, that's the city's problem. Um, that's what we do. We separate. We create distance. Distance reduces what we call touch points and memorable encounters. So the way that you create humanity with other people is you have experiences with them and you have memorable encounters with them. Um, Irving Goffman is an incredibly well-known sociologist. Uh, he sort of had this framing of like, if you don't see people, if they're not, it's actually called framing, if they're not in your frame, um, they don't exist to you. And so part of the threat to humanity and to our sustainability is the fact that we continue to try to act like we don't see people or don't need to see people. Uh, here in Dallas, we have the largest population of homeless people, in, of people experiencing homelessness rather in the South. Um, and it is a huge problem because we continue to criminalize them and victimize them and just move them to the next place, right? Like not District 10's problem, shh, not District 11's problem, shh, just throw them out to the next council district, throw them out to the next city. It's everybody's problem, right? Homelessness is a public health crisis. Homelessness is an economic crisis, right? All of these things are, are everybody's problems. But we're, but we're in this framing right now where if we just cut that, if we just say, mm, my only problem is this. This is the only community I need to care about. Nothing else really matters. Uh, we don't help our own community and we don't help others' communities and we're, we're just not behaving in a sustainable fashion at all. So I, I just want to I just want uh, to 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 jump on that for a minute. I mean, there there was actually so many good questions uh, coming into the into the chat here, um, and so I kind of I kind of want to take a, a moment. Uh, now, this is a question I want to ask. It's it's a it's a question. I think it's it's a sensitive question, right? It's a question that that um, gets to the heart of of you know living. Look, I live in I live in Westchester. Cards on the table, you know, um, where I was just informed by my friend Howard that the parkway that I I so enjoy driving on with its you know, it's uh, precariously low overpasses, uh, was designed that way to prevent buses uh, from actually traveling on it. Uh, so when you didn't have the throughway, uh, well, basically, if you have the throughway, it kind of funnels the right, the right kind of traffic precisely through Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and the Bronx, which if anybody knows Westchester geography are specifically uh, identified as black areas, uh, historically. Um, and so I just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of completely- Yeah, uh, buses are a great example of the spatiality, right? Where we've attributed a certain community to a space. We say buses are used by X. There's nothing inherently like wrong with buses, mm -hmm. but buses are used by X. So now they're a space for that community. I don't want to be affiliated with it. I want to create distance from that community. Um, there are loads of people who would love buses in their very white, very wealthy neighborhood that are only very white and very wealthy. Um, <laughs> They, they would love to have more public transit. Um, elderly people are very often part of that community. Um, but because we now have this idea that a space for a certain community exists on that bus, uh, we don't, we don't want to use it. Ironically, uh, unfortunately, social service agencies don't understand that spatiality or don't seem to care about that spatiality and don't treat buses as social service providers, right? Buses could be equipped with Wi-Fi, they could be equipped with cards for social service agencies, they could be equipped with social workers, right? Social worker could ride the bus all day and talk to people, like why not, right? They could be, they could be great for so many different things, um, but we don't treat them that way except for exclusion. Right, right. Well, I just, I just want to kind of so, so to continue sort of the, 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 uh, the, the point there. Um, a question from, from the listener, uh, an attendee tonight, and I'm very, I'm very grateful to Phil Miller for asking this question, uh, because it really gets to the heart of, of some, I think, why this is a hard issue for, for us to talk about um, in, in our little world. Um, now I'm being inclusive, exclusive, you know, of, of the YU kind of world, right? Um, and, and, and Phil asks, and I, and I really, again, I just want to say I appreciate him asking this question, are Froome neighborhoods part of the problem? What are possibilities of opening up these neighborhoods? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, preview for my forthcoming article and hopefully forthcoming book on this. 
Um, <laughs> so yes, yes and no, it's complicated. Uh, from neighborhoods are what you would call common interest developments, CIDs. Uh, gated communities also fall into common interest developments. When I think of from neighborhood, by the way, I'm, I'm thinking of within an Arab. Okay, so that's the spatiality boundary that I'm talking about. So let's say take whatever happens within the Arab. On the one hand, uh, we are part of the problem because we have a sociological issue of racism in our community. Uh, it's very common. We see it very often with people, not just who are non-Jews who are of a different race, but even Jews of color, very often experience racism in our Jewish communities. So we still apply that to our communal life in a lot of ways in that we seek out, um, unfortunately, mechanisms for exclusion very often. Uh, we are particularly focused on our community and our communal development and continuity. Jewish continuity is like the big hot topic for every, every Jewish you know, communal organization. We create networks of organizations to support that, you know, that circle that I was drawing around community. We do a great job at that in a way that could be a model for other communities. But we also do it in a way that excludes people from actually being able to get into the resources that we have that don't necessarily need to only service us. So a good model where we don't do that is, for example, Jewish Family Services. Very often, the JFS in your community can also service you know, non-Jews and whatever. But, a, but an example where we don't do that so well is, you know, I mean, I come from Ohio, let's say, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, other, other states that have vouchers where we actively take money from the public school system to support our own, you know, like you know, religious school system. That's an example where we don't do that well, uh, where we are actually taking money for an exclusionary system, right? If a public school child wanted to attend one of our from schools, we would say no. If we couldn't, uh, if we couldn't clearly say no, we would create a lot of reasons why it wouldn't happen, right? There's a reason it doesn't happen, um, but we yet we still take public dollars that are intended for a public good, which is public education, into our schools that we want for exclusion. So that's where we don't do a great job. Um, there are systems in which that, that can be not entirely inequitable in which we can create private resources for a private community. Those are good. It is good for private communities to be able to say, this is a resource we want, this is a resource that's important to us. But when we then extend that to the public community by taking resources from that community for our private resources, that's not good. It creates a lot of animosity. And I will say, coming from Ohio, there's a lot of animosity over this specific issue in Jewish schools and in the neighborhoods where the Jewish schools are. And you can come up with every other reason why you think it's like legally okay, but is it right? Is it moral? Is it just? We don't ask ourselves that very often in the Jewish community when it comes to, you know, interactions with outside the community. The other issue is that in the Jewish community, we do also exhibit a lot of those behaviors that I was talking about, about you know, being inside the community and sort of the bad things that happen when you're in there. But because you're only told that the monster is on the outside, things don't get fixed on the inside, right? We see this obviously with cases of um, you know, content trigger warning here with cases of you know, child abuse and molestation, uh, you know, other issues that happen very much within the community. Domestic violence happens within the community. But we have a very hard time registering that because we create such a density around our community and, and around this idea that we are all good and deeper, denser connections with each other is what sustains us. But those deeper, denser connections can also be a feeding ground for people who are evil actors. And we don't have a good mechanism for determining that and for kind of evicting those evil actors. Um, and so we can create issues not just for people on the outside and, and you know, intercommunal relations, but even intra communal relations. At the same time, we very often need our own spatiality in order to exist without, um, you know, no matter how hard we might try to assimilate, I think over and over and over again, regardless of whether it's religious assimilation, cultural assimilation, whatever it is, we see over and over again that we, we can't, like it's, just, it's not happening. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of different sociological push and pull factors as to why that happens. But it's not happening. Like Jews are not a mass uh, assimilating. In fact, more and more in the 21st century, we're finding Jews identifying specifically as non-white, right? That they're they are actually, regardless of religiosity, growing their identity more and more and more out of this idea that being Jewish is something different, right? It is an identity outside of you know wanting to assimilate into whiteness. 
So it's good that we have that. And I think every community should have that, that sense of like, this is our place, these are our people, this is what we can have, but it shouldn't come at the cost of intercommunal relations and intracommunal concerns. I want to say I've been very lucky to have been dominating the questions here, uh, uh, and 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 I and I get to ask the questions that I like to ask. Uh, but there are so many good questions here. So I, I we're, I'm looking at the clock, and and I, I want to I don't want to I don't want to drag you uh, beyond your your contractual obligation. <laughs> I'm sorry, my husband is very young. He gets to sleep. I think he's actually on here. Oh, fantastic, and... fantastic. But I but I do want to kind of give a chance, you know, for people who aren't me. Uh, and don't have my particular interests uh, to, to kind of um, um, join in the conversation. So what I would like to do uh, at this point is if someone would like to kind of ask a question directly, uh, if you could please raise your hand and, uh, and then I will, I, will, I will call on you and you can unmute yourself and, and we can take it from there. Is that, is that all right with you, Hannah? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So um, let's have at it. Open, open floor. Uh, and yes, uh, I see uh, Tanya Tolchin. Uh, question, please. Uh, Tanya, I'm sorry, you're muted. I think you have to unmute her. Oh, I have to mute her. I'm sorry. Hang yeah. on. Let me do that. Uh, ask to unmute. Okay, this is a technical glitch. Uh, you have to. I beg your pardon. Bear with us, uh, Ronnie. I can't seem to unmute people. I think you should be able to ask to unmute and then she should be able to unmute. That's oh, usually how it happens. Do that, uh, there we go. Oh yes, now now I do. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I, I just had, um, I know this. Uh, I'm coming at this from a from a, a a lawyer's perspective. This is my second career as a graduate student, but um, and I did study zoning law, and I you know worked with um, uh, economic development corporation while I was in law school. I worked on Metro Tech actually in Brooklyn, and, and these and, and city planning commission. There is a lot of resistance, and this is not going to change anytime soon in the way that we would like. Although we have to keep our efforts vigilant. But I was thinking about something while listening to you, and it's very enjoyable. Uh, it's excellent, uh, uh, speak, uh, excellent presentation. Um, is it possible? I mean, I know that I am a student of early modernity, modernity, early modern, you know, Jewish history, and, and a little later than that. And there is this model of the Venetian, let's say the Venetian ghetto or the Florence ghetto. Now, I'm not saying we should obviously put people of color, Latinx, black, you know, people in ghettos. But unfortunately, we have inner cities. I, I teach at BMCC, you know, Borough Manhattan Community College. My students come from the inner city. You know, and they have their sets of problems, whatever. Is it possible, because there is this economic motivation, if we could, while at the same time fighting the discrimination, obviously in the courts and, and in the legislatures and whatever, take that model of the, of the ghettos, you know, where there was working at the work of Stephanie Siegmund and Robert Bonfield, and sort of, instead of this, like the color of, you know, that, the reading for today, this overly negative, kind of like depressing, you know, we're stuck in here, our space is horrible, sort of building a bridge from that space, going back and forth, and maybe making that space more economically viable, therefore encouraging development and kind of getting out of breaking this chain, you know, while, of course, while we're, what do you yeah, think? So so, th so there's generally two pathways that we take for policymaking when it comes to things like poverty. Uh, one of them is called place-based and one of them is called people-based. So place-based is where we say like this neighborhood, let's say has this really big problem and we're going to provide something for this neighborhood. So like opportunity zones are a place-based idea, right? Like your zip code has this element to it. That's where we're gonna put an investment. People-based is where we say, if you're of a certain you know, low income bracket or a certain identity bracket, whatever it is, that's this policy is going to help you. So there are problems with both. And the answer is that you need a combination and that your, your goal at the end of the day needs to be for that community to self-actualize, not to turn into your idea of what a self-actualized community looks like. And that's the problem that we have with gentrification is that every single time we do development in, in, poor, in poor and low income communities under the guise of investment, 
we end up creating investments for a different community. Or like they're intended to be for a different community. There's a lot of great research about this, like ethnographic research and, and auto ethnographic research about this happening in places like the Bronx, right? Where there, where people came in to, to invest in those neighborhoods, uh, but intentionally invested in a way that didn't match the people who live there. Um, but, but, but that brought other people to that neighborhood for housing that at one time wasn't as expensive as other areas, right? And then it grows more increasingly expensive. And then the people who live there actually get placed out. They get displaced and then they move somewhere else, right? And that, that's what constantly happens because we're not creating investment for that community. And the problem with creating a like sort of a singular place-based uh, agenda is that our provision of services is always value laden. So for example, the way that we you know, fund public schools, everybody knows it's silly to fund public schools based on property taxes. It doesn't make sense. It means if you live in a poor area, you're going to have less money and you're going to have worse schools. Everybody knows that. That's why suburban public schools are great because property taxes are fairly even. Um, they're consistently paid. Um, they're at a you know pretty high rate, so so they're going to be great. The other thing is that in suburban schools, overwhelmingly, especially the you know out there suburban schools, the exurban schools, you just don't have a lot of kids who need the school to function as a social service provider. If they have issues, they have parents who can usually pay out of pocket for tutors for other resources, right? So they monopolize those resources, and I'll say those parents. There's a lot of research that shows that those same parents even do it in urban public school systems. Right. They also monopolize resources there. So that's the problem is that in today's day and age, very different than, you know, early modern times, the needs of resources are so great. A goods resource and resources and opportunities are so great and so inequitably distributed that the fear of a, of a singularly place based model is that it's just going to become a proxy for disinvestment um, or a proxy for the wrong kind of investment. Um, and, and it's just, it's so easy, right? Like you were saying, it's so hard to undo all of this because um, it's so interconnected and so intertwined and there's so many values built into it. Um, but that's always the problem is that if we have a place-based model, then it becomes like that, right? Like the tenement buildings that had to be torn down because they were essentially like, you know, hallways and tenement buildings were essentially like hidden streets where you know, violence happened. Right? Again, that spatiality. We just put all these people in these big buildings and said, okay, well, now that's your building and that's your space. And like, you got to deal with that. Rats, mm, bed bugs, mm, violence, mm, whatever. Cool. That's your space. Deal with it. Um, you know, instead of things where people really live lives, you know, out publicly where they were protected by other people, um, where, you know, they didn't, where, you know, if someone had bed bugs, if someone has bed bugs 12 houses down from you, you're unlikely to get bed bugs right, in your single family detached home city. If someone has bed bugs, 12 apartments away from you, it's very easy for you to get bed bugs, right? So, you know, when we think about that spatiality and the way that we bring certain groups of people closer together in order to distribute resources inequitably, uh, that's, that's my biggest concern with kind of a singularly place-based model. Let me just build off that question. So, sorry, Howard, one second, but let me just build off that question uh, with, with another question uh, from, from Mindy Pollock, um, who, who really kind of, it's a perfect segue, uh, adds, you know, she, she asks, you know, what, what solutions have been successful in addressing these problems? What, 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 yes. what do you see as, as really effective ways of, of starting to address this? Yeah, so it comes with two pieces. Um, first of all, the most successful effort to integrate people into communities and be successful is called Moving to Opportunity. Uh, it was a massive effort to take urban families, black urban families, and move them into suburbs without this overwhelming like block of community moving, um, instead to intersperse families across different areas. Very, very, very successful. Um, we sort of try to do that now through what's called the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher, uh, where we say, okay, here's some, here's a voucher, here's a source of income, essentially. And you can use it to go rent a home in a nicer area, in a better area where, you're, where you will have more opportunity. The problem is, so that's good. The problem is on the other end, where cities don't have protections against source of income discrimination. So you as a landlord can say, I don't want to rent to you because you're Section 8 in most cities across the US. So we need to have both. Uh, we need to have both the protections from the city to, inf to you know, um, ensure that people can actually get there and get housing and get access to resources. And then we also need the support from the federal government, a massive expansion in the Section 8 housing voucher 
uh, program. I mean, like people don't realize that most low income folks are in the private real estate market. They're not in the, you know, they're not in public housing. Every single time I have this conversation, be like, oh, in public housing, like very few people uh, get Section 8 housing vouchers. Very few people are in anything that looks like public housing across the country. Most low income folks, especially outside of New York State, uh, where there are very different protections, you know, like tenant protections that you don't have in most other states. Most folks and most low income folks across this country are in a constant state of eviction and moving and eviction and moving, trying to make their way through the private rental housing market, which is predatory. Uh, with landlords who are not not around except to collect the check, right? Don't care, not involved because you're low income. And what are you going to do? Hire a lawyer, right? So we need legal aid society investments. Uh, we need more legal aid. We need more, you know, representation at eviction court and things like that. This is how you slowly but surely change the system. You look at the system in every single way it works because it works administratively, it works judicially, it works politically, it works economically, and that's how you fit in changes. Right? And you give people support systems to continue to do that. And you recognize, like, you know, as we should have recognized years ago, that it's more expensive not to fix this problem than it is to fix it. <laughs> right? Like I, I talk about this with homelessness all the time. At any given point in this country, in the US, there are about half a million people who are experiencing homelessness. Right? And any given night, there are probably about half a million people who are homeless. How many dollars, how many millions of dollars do we invest into moving those people around? rather than creating systems of supportive housing and then getting them into you know, uh, long-term housing, including wraparound services, right? Getting people into whatever mental health services they need, whatever economic services they need. There, is, there are so many ways to be able to do that. It, instead, we keep spending money on doing camp cleanups, right? Pushing people away out of wherever they were. Um, you know, the other thing is that we, we tell people, for example, you know, if you wanna to go to the shelter, you can't come with your stuff, right? There, I, I don't want to go somewhere without my stuff. Nobody wants to go anywhere without their stuff, right? We're, so we're not fixing problems. We're forcing people to decide between, you know, getting through the night or being with their community. And when we do that, when we engage in these kind of policy making, this kind of policy making where we like throw a bone to a community for something and we're not actually helping them, we just waste money. We really do. We just waste money. Um, same thing around police reform, right? When we talk about police reform as being trainings, but not as like actually firing people who are domestic violence abusers, right? Who are on your police force, which is an incredibly high number of police people across the country. Um, you know, we're not, we're not changing anything. So we need to actually take action. We, we need more people to speak up. Uh, there's a lot of great research about this actually at the local level, that a lot of the discretion, a lot of these decisions that happen at the local level are all really just about who shows up at a meeting, right? Who shows up at your city council meeting? Do you show up? Like, like when was the last time any of you went to a city council meeting? Um, they're online now, most of them, you can, you can show up. When was the last time you contacted your city council member? Right, and not just about something that specifically concerns you, right, about a larger issue. Um, something related to environmental justice. I'm actually emailing my, my city council member today because I heard about a neighborhood where their garbage just never gets picked up. That's an environmental justice crisis. That's a public health crisis, right? How many times do we do that? Because that is really where decisions are made. You think that decisions, sometimes we think decisions are being made in this way that's like so complex and we can't get through to it. But very often these decisions are like, you know, three people showed up to the meeting and said, we don't want multifamily housing. Our neighborhood doesn't want density. And the rest of the neighborhood is like, we don't care. We don't care if there's apartments here. Um, but that's, that's what everybody thinks is going on. And so showing up, you know, personally on, a, on, a, on an individual level, like show up. Uh, Howard, you, you had uh, indicated you wanted to ask something earlier. Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. When I think about American cities and going back even to colonial times, and I'll use New York as an example, but I'm sure every San Francisco, any of these other cities, but immigrants arrived and you took the island of Manhattan and it divided up between Harlem and Chinatown and Little Italy, the Jewish Lower East Side, um, the Wasp Silk Stocking District. Um, one, is that unique to the development in America or do you see that happening in London, Paris? And also, what could have, ha what could have occurred differently in our American history that that segmentation in a city would not have occurred? Yeah, so that's a great question. So ethnic neighborhoods are common in most cities, you're right. 
um, a culturally ethnic neighborhoods and then also kind of identity ethnic neighborhoods. So like a lot of cities also had like an LGBTQ kind of neighborhood too. Um, so there's, there's a lot of this legacy in cities where people have themselves sort of figured out where their space is. Um, it's, it, it's not uncommon in terms of a global phenomenon of people sort of segmenting into ethnic neighborhoods. Where it's uncommon is in just, you know, historically, and that's changed recently, but the U.S. used to take way more immigrants in than other countries did. Um, and also the U.S., you know, sort of had these higher values about integrating immigrants into U.S. culture. Um, and so what would happen is that you would come in as an immigrant, you weren't yet ready to assimilate, you didn't know the language, you didn't have a job, you know, all of those sorts of things. As you started to get those, housing was not so expensive. And so you're immediately able to kind of move into housing and you move into housing with your other immigrant neighborhood and you create these connections between each other, right? Like um, in, in kind of the Jewish neighborhoods, we had Landsmannschaft, right? Like mutual aid societies, right? So we, we create these deep connections within our neighborhoods. And then slowly but surely as, you're, as you and your neighborhood would build economic wealth and assimilation, you would then move out to sort of wherever you could. Uh, Jews have been an exception to a lot of this because Jews were still often, you know, discriminated against, even as they became American. Uh, other groups faced their own sort of discriminations, but were able to more quickly assimilate into American culture in a lot of different ways. Um, Jews kind of struggle with that. The difference is that once race became a factor uh, in the way that that race has in this country, you know, after the Civil War and then really the great migration from the South and generally from rural neighborhoods. Cause remember like black people didn't really exist in, in urban neighborhoods because they weren't really brought for urban work. Um, they were brought for rural work, for plantation work. So that's predominantly where black folks were. And then as they start to move into the cities and especially move up North, uh, this country really wasn't prepared to deal with that. Uh, a lot of, if you, if you know it much about the civil war, or, you know, a lot of the tensions there, a lot of the tensions were about the rights of states, right? And the degree to which states should be able to determine kind of federal policy and generally federalism, right? It was obviously about, it was a fight over, you know, the, the ability to own black bodies, to utilize black bodies, how people, you know, wanted to. Uh, but it's not like the North really had all that much experience with this uh, because the North urbanized much more quickly than the South. So as people started moving up North, really the North had to deal with this and, and figure it out. And what they did was they invested in, in space, right? They invested in suburbanization. Mass suburbanization is much more common in the North than any other in the Northeast than any other part of this country. Uh, I mean, like Chicago, the Chicago land area, right? Is like, if, like dozens, if not, I think it's over a hundred uh, technically like little different municipalities all around that area. Um, so that's sort of how we in this country have dealt with this change, you know, post the uh, beginning in the early 20th century or the late 19th century. So I don't really think there's anything different because we really haven't dealt with that. Uh, we continue to not be able to deal with that, right? Uh, we continue to not be able to deal with that immigration. Um, and instead, what we've done historically is we've allowed for like, you know, common interest assimilation. Um, you know, groups that we have at some points decided were good enough to be like Americans like me. Uh, they can live in my neighborhood, but not allowing for entirely different cultural identity, entirely different racial identity to come into that neighborhood and to be allowed to live there. Um, and so we don't, you know, and, and then we continue to disinvest in that community and continue to create that narrative through, you know, disinvestments in public school, um, the, you know, school to prison pipeline, uh, the way that we've, you know, I mean, massively criminalized uh, drugs in a way that has intentionally prisoned many, many, many Black people. Um, you know, we continue to engage in this. Um, and of course, the prison system, for anybody who doesn't know, is pretty much like indentured servitude. Um, I don't know if anyone is, is familiar with this, but um, yeah, the prison system is wild. Um, find out how many products your state prison uh, actually makes for you. It's frightening. Um, or I rather the people in your state prison at like seven cents an hour. So um, yeah, so we, we really haven't dealt with this. We, we just really haven't. I think in the Jewish community, what makes us unique is that we have this history of, um, of these experiences and, and of this oppression that should allow us to relate to this group of people 
uh, we have a continued history of discrimination that should allow us to relate to this group of people. But what the one of the constant tensions in the Jewish community since you know the mass migrations in the late 1940s and 1950s has been whether we're going to ally with those groups or continue to push towards being integrated into American life. Uh, and we have overwhelmingly as a community in various ways, and I, I actually don't think this is drawn between orthodoxy and non-orthodox communities. I think both communities have done this, um, pushing away from the idea of being allied with oppressed groups towards the idea of being our own very specific, unique form of oppression, and of bigotry and of discrimination that we only work to solve for ourselves. You see this countless times with zoning and land use cases. Um, there is no reason why when Lakewood Yeshiva wants to build a new dormitory and they're faced with NIMBYism, they don't advocate for change for all groups that are faced with NIMBYism, right? Except that they take the view that it's their sort of oppression, right? It's, it's anti-Semitic. It's specifically for us. These people don't want us. No, these people don't want anybody who doesn't look like them. They don't want anybody who's gonna drive too many cars. They don't want anybody who's gonna shake up their lifestyle that's specific to the way that they're comfortable with. Uh, but we don't ally with other groups and we don't see them as natural partners in what we're doing. Um, because in part, we think that, you know, we have to build these, co like, these collective movements with people. It means we're totally on the same page and it means we're everything the same. We don't want to be the same. We want to be different. But what many years of movement work have taught us is that you can have shared identity and you can have separate identity, right? You can have a big tent in which you say, we're advocating for this, you're advocating for this, we're all in this together. Um, the movement for Medicare for all is a perfect example of that where you have many different groups approaching this issue from different perspectives. You know, you have a nurses union advocating for Medicare for all. Um, you, have, you have other groups, you know, advocating for Medicare for all coming at it with different perspectives, but all saying, hey, we have a shared goal here. Let's collectively, you know, organize for this issue, get this issue passed, and then we go our own ways and we live our lives how we want to live. But, but the Jewish community has resisted that. Uh, broadly, I mean, in, in a very interesting way where we like simultaneously want to still be accepted as, you know, like white Americans, but we also want to have our very unique form of discrimination that will not allow us to work with other groups. Um, Sorry to just no, throw in some critique. I, mean, I think uh, I, I'm, this is, I, I mean, just a really wonderful uh, set of remarks, um, but I don't, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because uh, you're really putting in, uh, you know, a full nine innings today. Uh, sorry for the baseball analogy. I'm an hour behind central time. So it's only 7.20. Oh, I see. <laughs> so in addition to saying uh, go Mets, I would like to say, um, you know, if there's one more question, perhaps, um, to, to sort of close uh, uh, out the evening, um, uh, I see both my colleague, uh, Dr. Perellis and my and my student, Laura. So I'm, uh, uh, Ronnie, I apologize. Gonna, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with. <laughs> Who is, who is literally, let me just say, is sitting up at, what is it, three o'clock in the morning in Tel Aviv uh, uh, every week to attend this class. And so I'm very, I, I have to, I have to give the floor. That's commitment. Sitting that never sleeps, Tel Aviv. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Professor Perellis. Um, first of all, I want to say that it's fascinating and your career is so impressive. And the fact that you're a firm lady is really fascinating and I want to ask you a question about that. Um, there are some rabbis who are in general not specifically about blacks but they are afraid of the integration with gentiles. How do we use the fear that One second, that just one second. I'm sorry, sorry, hold on. Okay, sorry, go on. My computer was about to die and I didn't just want to duck out for no reason. Yes, go. <laughs> How do it has been a use the fear they have from this interaction and do it a fuch or a fuch and have them fear what will happen if we don't integrate, if we don't consolidate, if we don't become one and think of a united future for ourselves and our children. So I'm wondering what your take is on this. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think what's interesting right now, and I think what we're moving towards because Okay, so remember we talked about touch points and uh, encounters, meaningful encounters. So that happens when we shrink space and time, right? When we have immediacy, when you experience in, in something right there, then something is in your frame, right? In Goffman's frame. Um, what's happening right now, I think in part, in large part due to the internet, 
uh, is that we're shrinking time and space constantly and we're creating communities out of choice. And so a lot of people sort of have their spatial community. So where you live, right? Like I live in Dallas. You have your social community, you might say, you know, Orthodox Jew or academic or whatever it is, but then you have a community of choice. And through your community of choice, that's actually more of your formal and, informa and, and informal information network. We see this very often, unfortunately, unfortunately, with anti-vaxxers, right? That they're a community of choice. There's no, you know, they don't all live in one place. They don't all identify through a singular framing, but they have an interest that brings them together and it shrinks time and space. And they're constantly sharing information through formal and informal networks to support one worldview. Um, I think that there are a lot of ways for Jews and especially from Jews to use that to shift a lot of the dynamics that some of us are upset about. Um, I think there are a lot of ways that we can create formal and informal networks um, to shift that. We can use the strength of our institutions. So like for me, for example, like I always joke, like I, I have no plans to not be from, like I can critique everything from right to left. I have no plans on ever leaving. First of all, because it's very important to me as a person, very important to my family. Also because I lose, when I lose that institutional affiliation, I lose the entire formal and informal network that comes with that. So I can't change it anymore. And that's where we see a lot of pushback when people who leave the community, which is very fine and valid and strength, um, when people do that and then they try to change the community, because you, you've lost some of your formal and informal network there and you've lost the institutional base. So building on institutional base, but creating different formal and informal networks by shrinking time and space, I think is how we see a lot of change. And I'll tell you, leaders are more afraid of that than I think we realize. Um, I am like, for all intents and purposes, just a random person who lives in Dallas who let's say talks a lot on the internet and overshares very often. But for some reason, I get found and I get invited to things like this. And then I get to speak to a different audience and I get to share my information through a formal or informal network, which then goes on to share it. And, and leaders know that. And that's why they're scared of people like me. They're scared of you know, other people who are willing to critique and are willing to stand up and write and speak. The other thing is that content creation, right? The information age is all about content creation. And again, you know, leaders know this. That's why they have a consistent flow of very specific content that they want to be sent out, right? And a very specific way that they use their own formal and informal networks. And if you wanna change that, you have to use the system. You use it to promote your own view, you use it to create your own community of choice and to push the agenda of your community of choice. What I see very often is that a lot of people are really okay with being consumers of the community of choice, but not with being producers. And we need to step up and be producers of your community of choice. So that means that if you if you feel like your community of choice, let's say, exists on Instagram, it's not enough to just like things from other people or to send you know private comments. You also need to become a producer of knowledge and information. Because going back to my map over here, let's say you're over here, right? So when you become a producer, you extend your network and you bring it into your community of choice. And that's what we need to be doing a lot more of if we want to see change. Unfortunately, many of us aren't connecting, we're not producing, we're not understanding the value of affiliation. And so we're not creating that change because it's so easy when you're isolated and when you do this on your own without a network to get knocked down because every single one of us has things that would obviously knock us down just like the leaders have, by the way but we don't have that network behind us. And when you create community and when you create that network, you have that and you can shift it. And you have to create a product that is so good that it can't be ignored. So you use all of these elements of, you know, modern, I, I, well, some people would say postmodern times, but I just call it the information age. Use all of these elements, use the medium, the network, the content, the quality, right? These are things we all know are really big buzzwords for creating any kind of product. That's really what this is. Because if we were really living according to, let's say, religious, you know, Judaism, a lot of our institutions and a lot of the way we do things just wouldn't exist, right? Like the last time I checked in the Torah, there's nothing that says that I have to stand by the police and some thin blue line flag, right? There's nothing in the Torah that says that. But it becomes, for some communities, a part of their religious identity, a part of their cultural identity, a part of their communal identity. And if you don't tap into that and recreate information and, re and use a good media and have high quality content, then you're not going to see a shift. So I think a lot of us need to stand up from being consumers of that information to being producers 
and to believe that what we have to say is valuable and to encourage other people to continue to say it. So like here I am, I spent the last hour and whatever just talking to you all, but I expect you all to talk about what I said to other people. Because honestly, like, I don't really care. Like, I'm not walking away from this saying, look at how many people I touched. I'm thinking about, look at how many meaningful encounters you all had with me, that you got to hear me, which by the way, thank you so much. And you go out and you have meaningful encounters with this content with other people and you spread your network. And that is how we see change. Does that, does that answer your question? I personally cannot think of a more perfectly attuned way to, to uh, conclude our program tonight. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time, taking a lot of time with us tonight. Um, I, I assure you that, that this, this conversation at our institution is a very valuable one. And, 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 I, and I say this from the heart, you know, that, that it, is, it is so gratifying to me that we're able to have these discussions and have these conversations and really participate in discussions that are just, that, look, I mean, this is just, this is what we have to be talking about. And, and I'm, 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 a little, I'm a little emotional because I'm just so pleased, right, that, that you were able to just so, so wonderfully articulate uh, so many very important points. Uh, and so uh, you have my thanks, and I'm now going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Professor Steve Fine, the director of the YU Center for Israel Studies and professor of Jewish history uh, for our concluding remarks. Thank you, Jess. First of all, uh, Dr. Leibovitz, I hope you'll come back to see us soon on campus in the flesh. Uh, it'll be a pleasure to meet you and, and to really get to know you better and for you to get to know our community and for us to get to know you and learn from you in, in ways that make us all better. So please come visit us really soon. Um, this pro project, Why You Voices, is a project of the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program in International Affairs, my own YU Center for Israel Studies, our beloved Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, and all of us together as Mada'e Yadu Judaic Studies at Yeshiva University. All of us thank you and wish everyone well, and most of all, Shalom from Yeshiva University. Thank you. Talk about this with your friends. <laughs>